Welcome back to Digital Systems 2. In this video, we're going to discuss magnitude comparators, code converters, and data busing. So our objectives in this video is basically to learn how to analyze the operation of a magnitude comparator. We're going to learn how to describe circuits that convert from one coding method to another. And then we're going to discuss data busing and analyze how data is transferred between devices on a bus. So another useful logic circuit or logic device to be aware of is called a magnitude comparator. On the screen, you can see a block diagram of the 74HC85. It's a four bit magnitude comparator. Its basic function is to compare two binary quantities and generate an output to indicate which one has the greater magnitude. You'll see there are three outputs at the bottom of the picture. And uh, one of these outputs will be high depending on whether input A was greater than B, A was less than B, or if A and B are equal. The magnitude comparator you see on the screen also comes with three inputs here that are used for cascading. So if you want to compare to 8-bit numbers or to 12-bit numbers, you would use these inputs to cascade. Here is the magnitude comparator truth table showing how the inputs would be compared. So for example, let's say I'm comparing two numbers, number, uh, number A and number B. They're each four bits. If the third bit of number A is bigger than the third bit of number B, doesn't really matter what comes next. We know that A is greater than B, and this output will be high, indicating that A is greater than B. If A was less than B, if the first bit of A is less than the first bit of B, we again don't really care what happens next because we can see that your entire number is going to be less, yeah, number A is going to be less than number B. So think about comparing the number 8, which is 1000, to the number 7, which is 0111. The first bit automatically tells you which number is bigger. So by comparing that first bit, we can automatically tell which output should be high. But let's say that the first bit is equal. Then we would compare based on the value of the second bit. If the second bit of number A is higher than B, we know that the, the number A is larger than number B. Or vice versa, if the second bit of number A is smaller than number B, we know that the entire number is smaller. So this truth table will explain how your outputs will be determined based upon the inputs. And the cascading inputs right here are from a lower significant word, meaning if you think about comparing two 8-bit numbers, the first four bits are your most significant bits, the second four bits are your least significant bits. So your cascading inputs here will come from your lower significant bits. And these really won't come into play unless every bit from your higher significant word is equal. So let's say I'm comparing the number 11111000 to the number 11110111. The first four bits are equal, so we don't really know what the answer is going to be just looking at the first four bits, so we'd have to look at these cascading inputs to determine, well, what was higher or lower from the second set of bits, from the lower significant bits in that entire number. So the truth table here just sort of explains that concept. And now we're going to do a couple of examples showing how that cascading will work. So we're going to describe the operation of the 8-bit comparison circuit below for two cases. So we can see that the first number, number A, is 10101111. Second number, number B, is 10110001. So the first four bits, bits seven through four, will be applied here for each number. So A7 through A4 will be applied here, B7 through B4 will be applied here. This is called the higher order comparator. It's comparing the higher order bits. The lower order bits, A3 through A0, 
B3 through B0 will be applied here and here. So the lower order comparator will compare this, these sets of bits and determine which one was higher. Based on which one was higher, one of these output signals will be high. And um, so we can see here, the lower order bits are 1111 and 0001. So when we look at the lower order bits, we can see that number A is larger than number B, and this output right here will be high. And this output here will become an input to the higher order comparator and it really will only be used if we happen to have an equal value between the two numbers applied to this comparator. In this case, we can see that A7 through A4 is 1010 and B7 through B4 is 1011. In this case, 1011 is higher and we don't really care about the input that's coming from the lower order because we can automatically see that uh, the input B is higher than A. And this output right here will be high, indicating that fact. So the higher order comparator will compare 1010 and 1011 and determine that input B is larger. So that output a less than B, that output will be one to indicate that A is smaller than B and the outputs of the lower order comparator won't matter in this case, they're not used. Like comparing the number 257 to 198, by looking at the hundreds column, I can already tell which number is bigger. I don't have to look at the tens column or the ones column, same idea. But the second example, here is number A, 1011-1111, and number B, 1011-1001. Here's a case where your higher order comparator is going to compare the same number, 1011-1011, and it's going to find that those two numbers are equal. So then it's going to defer to whatever is being cascaded in from the lower order comparator. So the lower order comparator is going to compare 1111 and 1001, and it's going to determine that 1111 is higher. So in this case, the lower order comparator is then going to have an output here that says that A is larger than B. That output becomes an input here, and the higher order comparator will then determine which number is larger based off of the lower order output. Since the lower order bits show that A is larger than B, the final output for this case would be that A is larger than B. It's like comparing 115 to 110. They both have a 100 in the hundreds place, so now we have to look at the tens place to determine who's larger. So in summary, the higher order comparator will determine the first four bits of both numbers are equal and will then rely on the output of the lower order comparator, which will be that input A is larger than B. That's the output that will be high. The higher order comparator will then produce that the output A is larger than B. That output will be a one as its final output. This is how a magnitude comparator operates. Here's an application of a magnitude comparator. It could be used in something like a digital thermostat. So here's a, a, a schematic of what your thermostat might look like. The measured room temperature is converted to a digital number and applied to the A inputs of the comparator. So here's our comparator. Here's a temperature sensor. It's going to sense the temperature of the room. That's an analog quantity. That analog quantity will be sent to an analog to digital converter so that it can be converted to an 8-bit number. So if the room temperature is 78 degrees, that 78 degrees will con be converted to an 8-bit number right here and sent into the inputs of your comparator. Next, we have the keypad. This is where the user will enter the temperature they want the room to be. And let's assume that this is a thermostat for 
a, a northern home where it's cold outside and we want to warm the room if the room is too cold. This is the scenario that we have. We're warming up the room rather than cooling down the room in this case. So the keypad is where the user will enter in the desired room temperature and that desired room temperature is then stored in a register that is connected to the B inputs right here to your comparator. So the comparator is then gonna compare the actual temperature in the room to what the temperature is supposed to be according to the keypad, according to the user. And uh, depending on what the temperature in the room is compared to what the user wants, the comparator needs to send a signal to turn on the furnace to warm up the room. So the next thing that's gonna happen is that if A is less than B, meaning the temperature in the room is lower than we'd like, the furnace should be activated to heat the room. And take a look at what's used to activate the furnace. This is a NOR latch. And if you don't remember the truth table for a NOR latch, it's right down here. We basically have the set state, the reset state, and an undefined state. So if the set input is one, then the, uh, the output Q will be one, assuming that the reset state is low. And if the reset state is one, while set is zero, then that's when we clear the output of the flip-flop. The zero, zero input state represents no change. So if both of them are low, whatever Q was before, it'll stay that way. And then if they're both one, this is an undefined state. We would not intentionally put both of those inputs to be high. So in this case, if A is less than B, this output right here will go high. If the room needs to be warmed up, this output right here will go high, which goes into the set input of our latch. So that means that the output of the latch will be one and that high is the signal to turn on the furnace. Furnace should continue to heat while A is less than B and it'll shut off when A equals B. So as long as we're continuously comparing the room temperature to my desired temperature, as long as the room temperature is less than the desired temperature, the NAND latch will continue to give an output of one. But as soon as the temperatures are equal, this output will go to a zero and this output will be the one that's high right here. So as the room cools off after the furnace turns off, uh, the furnace uh, will stay off while the two temperatures are equal and turn on again whenever the temperature in the room drops below the desired point. Now the, I, this is just an example to show how we would heat the room. Obviously we would need additional logic here if we were also trying to cool the room. So if we wanted to heat the room whenever the room is too cold, we would have this, uh, this output here controlling the furnace to turn on. But if we wanted to cool the room, this output here would need to control your air conditioner now. So that if the room temperature is too high, it's higher than what we want, this is actually the signal you would send to your AC unit to turn it on to cool off the room. So this only shows heating up the room and not cooling down the room because it's a simplified example, but this is one, um, one application of many where you would see a magnitude comparator used to control a digital thermostat. Next, we're moving on to a new topic called code converters. A code converter is a logic circuit that changes data presented in one type of binary code to another type of binary code. For today's discussion, we're going to think about a code converter as a device that can take a BCD input and give me the binary equivalent. Binary equivalent. So the basic idea of a two-digit BCD to binary converter is what we're going to be studying today. We're going to go over what kind of logic would be required so that as a user, I can enter in a BCD value and get a binary equivalent. One application of this type of code converter might be transferring data from a DMM to computer memory. 
let's say that you take a voltage measurement or a current measurement, you're going to get a digit or two on your screen. And let's say that, for example, you measure 42 milliamps. That 42 could potentially be a BCD value depending on the style or depending on the programming of your DMM. Let's assume that it is a BCD value. How do we get that to a binary equivalent? Because we don't want to just store the, the digit 4 and the digit 2 in memory. We want to store the number 42 in memory. In order to store the number 42 in memory, that needs to be a binary value, zeros and ones. So how can we create a circuit that will complete that conversion for us? That's the question. So first we need to really study the weights of a BCD number and how they relate to a binary equivalent. So the bits in a BCD representation have decimal weights that are 8, 4, 2, and 1 within each code group. But they differ by a factor of 10 from one code group or one decimal digit to the next. So imagine writing the number 42 in BCD. So you have a BCD value. You want to write that number in binary. I know that this is the, the ones place and this is the tens place. So I need to figure out how I can have a binary equivalent. And I'm not talking about writing the number four as zero, one, zero, zero, and then writing the number two as zero, zero, one, zero. I'm talking about what is the actual binary equivalent value for the number 42 in BCD. So in order to really understand how to convert this, we have to think about the fact that we have a ones place and a tens place. So we know that the number 40, that's our tens place, our tens place equates to the number 40. In binary, the number 40 is 0101000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 32 plus 8. Now we look at the ones place. We know that 2 is just going to be 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So our binary equivalent for the BCD value of 42 would be to add these two values together. That's how we get a, a binary output from a BCD input. So we have to look at the ones place and write the value of that number in binary. Then we have to look at the tens place and write the value of that number in binary and then combine them or add them together. This is how a code converter, converter will take a BCD input and provide a binary output. So we're going to practice this skill by converting a number ourselves. Here's the number that we have. It's a BCD number. This would be 5. This would be 2. It's 52. And we're going to convert that to binary. So first we're going to write down the binary equivalents for all the ones in our BCD representation. Another way to think about that is the fact that the tens place is 50 and the ones place is 2. So we need to figure out the binary equivalents for 50 and 2. Um, so we can, we can go from that perspective. And the best way to do this is to really just look at every single one in your BCD number. So if your number isn't written out in zeros and ones, you can start by taking your BCD number, which is 52, writing that out as 0101010. And then looking at every one in your group. And then you can use this table over here to determine the weight for each one in your group. So the first one right here corresponds to this bit. So our bits go, this is the most significant bit, D1. This is the least significant bit, A0. And we're looking at the bits where there is a one. So that would be right here. So we're going to... Uh, Look at the decimal weight of that number. That The decimal weight is 2. The binary weight of that number is right here. So you're going to write that out, binary for 2. The next one you have in this particular example is right here. So if this is A0, B0, C0, D0, this is A1. A1, which is right here. And the weight for A1 is 10. And the binary value for 10 
is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So you're going to write that out right there. And then the last one you have corresponds to, this is C1, A1, B1, C1, D1. This is C1 right here. Look at your weight. C1 has a weight of 40, which is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. So you're going to write that out right here. Once you do that, you add them all up to get your binary value of 52. This is how we convert from uh, a BCD value to a binary value. And the reason why we're doing it this way is because we have to get a circuit to think like this and to implement this idea. So our BCD input is 0101. Zero, one, zero, one. 0, 0, 1, 0, and our binary output is the equivalent for that BCD number, 52. Here's another example I want you to try following the same process. You're going to convert 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, which is 95. Remember, BCD means you take the first four bits and make that a number. 1, 0, 0, 1, that's 9. 0, 1, 0, 1 is 5. So you have the number 95 in BCD. We need the binary equivalent to that number, 95. So take a minute to try this out on your own and then check back for the solution. Here's what the solution is for this one. Again, you're looking at each one in your BCD number. Simply write the weight for each one of those ones and add them all up. And the weights are shown right here in the table. We can see with these weights how the ones place and the tens place are reflected here. So this takes into account that with the BCD number, your first or most significant digit, if you only have two digits, is the tens place. So with each one in your group, you'll have one that has a weight of one. This one right here has a weight of four. This one right here has a weight of 10. This one right here has a weight of 80. And I'm getting each one of those weights by using the table on the right. Remember, A0 is your least significant bit. D1 is your most significant bit. Write the weights for all of the ones in your number and add them up. Then you'll get the number 95 in binary, which is right here at the bottom. So a code converter is a circuit that will be able to do this entire process for you. Here's an example of a circuit that can do exactly that. This circuit uses two 74HC83s, those are four bit parallel adders, to perform the BCD to binary conversion process. So the way that this is set up, your BCD representation goes in right here. Notice that some of these bits are transferred down to this adder here. Some of them go down here, and some of these inputs are outputs from the other adder. What you'll get is a six-digit, a seven-digit binary equivalent for your BCD input. So we're going to take another example to analyze how this circuit works and prove that it actually does provide a binary equivalent for a BCD input. So let's assume that the BCD representation for 56 is applied to the converter below. Determine the outputs from each adder and the final binary output. So we have the number 56, which in BCD, B0, Zero, one. That's your five. And then your six would be zero, one, one, zero. So those are your inputs that are being applied. And we're going to follow the logic to see what the solution is going to be for the output. So when we write down the BCD representation, we get zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero. You can see that A0 simply becomes 
the last bit of the output. So we know that bit already. The top inputs to the upper adder are 0, 0, 1, 1. Follow these inputs. We have a 1 here, 1 there, a 0 there, and input 3 is connected to B1, which is also a 0. So we have 0, 0, 1, 1 going into the top, and the bottom inputs are 0, 1, 0, 1, and we're just going to follow the diagram. So input 0 and input 2 are both connected to A1. Inputs 3 connected to B1. That's how we get 0, 1, 0, 1 on the bottom. So this adder is going to add those two inputs together and get this as a sum. That's the sum. So if we look at sum 3, sum 2, sum 1, sum 0, that's the sum that's going to come out right there. So that's the output of the first adder. So we can see that sum 1 and sum 0 directly fall down into our final output. Sum 3 and sum 2 are fed to the lower adder right here. So the inputs to this adder are going to be D1, which is a 0. The output, the carry output here, which was 0. And then you have your sum 3 and your sum 2. That's how these inputs become 0, 0, 1, 1. These inputs down here are going to be 0. Inputs 2 and 0 are going to be connected to C1. So those are both a 1. And input 1 is connected right here to this input 3, which is coming from D1. So that's how you get 0, 1, 0, 1 being added on the bottom. Add these together. These form your final sum. And you can see that sum 3 is your first bit of your answer. Sum 2 is your second bit. Sum 1 is your third bit. Sum 0 is your fourth bit. The fifth, sixth, and seventh bits have already been determined by the adder before or your input here. And your output becomes 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. And that's your binary equivalent for 56. So we can see the outputs of each adder as well as your final binary output. This is how a, a code converter might work to convert BCD into binary. Now we're going to completely switch gears for a minute and talk about a completely different topic called data busing. In computers, transfer of data takes place over a common set of connecting lines called a data bus. There are devices that are tied onto the bus, and they have what's called tri-state outputs, or they're tied to the data bus by tri-state buffers. We'll go over those concepts in a minute. Devices you would commonly see connected to a data bus are microprocessors, semiconductor memory chips, digital to analog and analog to digital converters. These are just examples. Uh, you could have a keyboard, you could have a mouse, you could have a display. Anything that needs to send or receive data is gonna be connected to a bus. So here's an example of what a bus might look like. Here's your data bus. So these are transmission lines or these are wires that can send or receive data. Notice how we have several devices connected to our bus. We have a microprocessor, which is designed to receive data from the bus. Notice these are inputs to the microprocessor. We have a 8-bit counter. That's called device 1. It's an 8-bit counter. There's your clock. You have an enable, which enables the data to, to flow onto the bus. And if your enable is allowing data to flow, the output of your 8-bit counter will flow onto the bus and will be available on your data bus lines. Now, data that's sent to the bus may or may not be received by something else. That all depends on your enable. For example, this microprocessor may, be, may need to be enabled to read data from the bus. If it's not enabled to read data from the bus, your 8-bit counter may be sending data that no one is receiving. 
So we have these two ideas of enabling data to go out onto the bus and then enabling data to be read from the bus. So the enable right here would be considered an output enable because it allows the output of the counter to travel to the bus. Device two is a keyboard encoder. So imagine that you have a device, a keyboard connected to your system. And each time I press a key, I want to send that data onto the bus. Again, that data can only be sent onto the bus if the output is enabled. That's what the OE stands for, output enable. Output enable. And then we have a third device, 74HC126 buffers that are connected to dip switches. And again, these switches can send data to the bus if the output is enabled to do so. So we have certain devices that may only send data on the bus. We have certain devices that may only read data from the bus. And then you'll see other devices that can do both, read from the bus and write to the bus. So in this particular diagram, and again, this is just a simplified example, but we have three different devices that can transmit 8-bit data over an eight-line data bus to a microprocessor. Only one device at a time should ever be enabled. We never want to have two devices sending data at the same time. If you did, you're, you would have an unpredictable input going to your microprocessor. You don't know if the data coming into the microprocessor is coming from device three or device one. So you always wanna make sure only one thing is enabled to send data at a time. We can have multiple things that can read data, but we should only ever have one thing that is writing data or sending data to a bus at a single point in time. So using this diagram that we presented here, we're gonna describe the conditions necessary to transmit data from device three to the microprocessor. So the things we want to consider here is who has the ability to write data? Who has the ability to read the data? Who is the one who's going to send the data and who's going to receive it? These are the things we want to consider. So in order for device three to transmit data to the microprocessor, enable three must be activated while enable one and enable two must be inactive inactive. So that means that the 8-bit counter should not be enabled to write data. Neither should your keyboard encoder. Both of these should be disabled while enable 3 is, is a, a allowed or activated so that your dip switches can send the data to the microprocessor. If you enable device 3 while you disable device 1 and device 2, this will put those two devices in what we call a high Z, high impedance state, and essentially it disconnects them from the bus. So if they're not enabled, we can consider them disconnected from the bus. We call that the high Z state. Z stands for impedance. The outputs of device three will be activated so that their logic levels will appear on the bus lines and be transmitted to the microprocessor. In this particular diagram, the microprocessor does not have any enables, but if it were shown to have an input enable, for example, we would need to make sure that the processor has also been enabled to receive that data. So what will the status of the data bus be when none of the devices are enabled? So let's think about a, a scenario where device one, device two, and device three are all disabled. No one is sending any data at this point. The microprocessor is actively trying to read any data that is available on the bus, but nothing is being sent. We call this the high Z state. And that means that all devices are disconnected from the bus. Essentially, that means there is no definite, definite logic level on any of the bus lines. So we don't really know at any point in time whether these bus lines are going to have zeros or ones. No one's sending any data. Everything is in a high Z state. We call this a floating bus. Floating bus. And each data bus line is said to be floating or in an indeterminate state. We don't really know what data is being sent to the microprocessor at this point in time. An oscilloscope display of a floating bus line would be unpredictable. 
A logic probe would indicate an indeterminate logic level. So whenever we have a floating bus, we really don't know what kind of data is being transmitted to the microprocessor. And this is why you essentially would also have an enable so that your microprocessor isn't just reading garbage from the bus when you don't need it to. So having an enable on the microprocessor would stop that microprocessor from reading data when you have a floating bus. Devices connected to a data bus will contain registers, usually flip-flops, that can hold data. So we've talked about registers before. The outputs of these registers are usually connected to what we call a tri-state buffer, which then allows the outputs to be tied to a bus. A tri-state buffer acts like a valve. We can control when data passes through it. When the control is active, data will flow. Here are two examples at the bottom showing a tri-state buffer with an active high control and another with an active low control. So in order for the input X to pass to the output, you have to apply a signal to the control, either active high or active low, depending on what type of tri-state buffer you have. A tri-state register is a group of flip-flops that hold data, and each output is connected to a tri-state buffer. So if I go back to this picture right here, where we, we, where we began to discuss data about busing, here are your tri-state buffers that control if the data is going to go onto the bus. And notice that these are connected to your enable. So your enable is really controlling this tri-state buffer, which is a, going to be the valve that allows data to flow or not flow, depending on what enable is. One common type of register that you'll see that has these tri-state buffers is a 74 ALS 173. This is a four bit register that's parallel in, parallel out. The flip-flops are connected to the tri-state buffers. To load the register, the data at the inputs is transferred into the flip-flops. And when you also have a hold operation where the data in the register does not change with the clock signal. So you can load the register, you can put new data in, and then you can just hold that data you, in, in, until you want to use it or change it at, at a future point in time. Here is a diagram of the 74 ALS 173. Again, this is a tri-state register. Basically, that means it's a register that can hold data, but each output is connected to a tri-state buffer. So the output of the flip-flop cannot really be transmitted unless the uh, tri-state buffers have been enabled. Notice that we have an output enable right here, and there are two of them that are active low. So we cannot allow the data coming out of these flip-flops to transfer to our bus unless both of these enables are low. This also has an input enable which controls when you can load new data into the flip-flops. If you want to supply new data to the D0, D1, D2, and D3 inputs, you first have to enable that data to be, uh, to be entered by applying two low signals right here. Notice in the function table, it says that when either output enable one or output enable two is high, the output is in the off state that's the high Z or high impedance state. That's the output. So those are your output zero, output one, output two, and output three, even though this does not affect the contents in the registers. So your registers may have zeros and ones, but what's actually passing to the physical output of this particular IC is going to be that high Z state if your enables are high, if your output enables are high. If either one of those is high, your outputs here will be in the high Z state. So using the function table for the 74 ALS 173, we're gonna answer a few questions. What input conditions will produce a load? What input conditions will produce a hold? What input conditions will allow the internal register outputs to appear at the output levels? So first let's talk about load. In order to load, 
Each Q output takes on the value present at its D input whenever a clock transition occurs, provided that your master reset is low and both input enable inputs are low. So we have a, a several things that have to happen. In order for you to load the flip-flop, your input enables have to be low. You also have to have a low signal applied to your master reset. Master reset was right here. This is an active high input. So if you want to force all the flip-flops to be cleared, you'll send a one right there. So if you want to load, that means that this should be a low signal here so that you're not clearing the flip-flops. You also need a clock pulse right here to transfer the data that's being applied at D0 into the flip-flop. And you need to have your input enables both low. That's the only way you're going to be able to load. Next, if I want to hold, that means that I, I have data in the flip-flops and I just want to store it for future use. I don't want it to go anywhere. The conditions you'll need to hold is basically summarized with this statement here. When either enable input is high, the D inputs have no effect and the Q outputs will retain their current values. So if we go back to this image right here, I can load something into the register as long as my input enables are low and a clock pulse occurs. But let's say that I've loaded my data and I want to hold on to it for later. Now I'm going to disable the inputs so that I can't put something new in there. As long as either one of these goes high, whatever data is inside the flip-flops is just going to be stored there until I load again. That's how you'll hold the data. And then lastly, what do we need to do to allow our internal register outputs to appear at O? So the output buffers are enabled when both output enable inputs are low. This will pass the register outputs through to your external outputs. If either one of those output enable inputs is high, the buffers will be disabled and the outputs will be in the high Z state. So again, that's looking now at the output enables. Both of these have to be low for the data that is in Q to be passed to the output. If either one of these is high, your outputs are going to be considered in the high Z state, which essentially means no output. Nothing is coming out of that register. So here's a summary once again of what we need to load, what we need to do to hold, and what we need to do to pass data to the output. So here is a diagram of a few tri-state registers that are connected to a data bus. Here's our bus. Notice that these registers can take data in from the bus as an input or output data to the bus as an output. Each one of the registers has our input enable and our output enable our master reset. We have our clock signal that goes into each one of these registers. And the contents of any one of the three registers can be parallel transferred over the data bus to one of the other registers through proper application of logic levels to the register inputs. So for example, register one can put data on the bus that register two can receive. But that's only gonna happen if register one has give, been given permission to output data and register two has been given permission to read that data. So we have to look at what's enabled to output, what's enabled to input at a particular point in time. Remember, only one register should be outputting at any point in time. The timing diagram below shows various signals involved for the transfer of data, and the data is, is 1011 from register A to register C. So if I want to transfer data from register A, register A has to have its output enabled. If I want that data to go into register C, its input must be enabled, and those are both active low. So once both of these go low, 
and the clock makes a transition. The data that was in register A will be put onto the bus. And then register C will receive that data from the bus. Notice prior to that clock pulse, we have this indication here. This is the floating high Z state. So if you want to show on your timing diagram that there, there is no data on the bus because no one is sending anything right now, that's how you would draw it. So we can see that at T1, register A, outputs are enabled and its data goes onto the bus. With a positive clock transition, that data transfers from the bus into register C at time two. And then at time three, the register A outputs are disabled because the output enable goes back high and the data bus returns to its high Z state because no one is sending data to the bus right now. No one is connected. So here's a simplified representation of the bus arrangement showing that we have an eight wire bus. We have eight inputs that could go in to any one of the registers. We have eight outputs that could come out to any one of the registers, and that is all controlled by your enables for each register. Manufacturers have developed ICs that connect inputs and outputs internal to the chip, so you don't necessarily have to wire a bus yourself. This reduces the number of IC pins and bus connections. Each input-output line will function as an input or an output depending on the states of the enable inputs. And we call this bi-directional data lines. The fact that a, piece of, that, a, that a data line can be an input or an output is called a bi-directional data line. So this is an example of a bi-directional register where these connections here could be inputs or outputs depending on what you supply at your enables. We'll do one more example using our tri-state registers. For the bus arrangement shown, we're going to describe the input signal requirements for transferring the contents of register A to register C. Con transferring the contents of register A to register C. So if we're going to transfer what's in A into register C, we should first have um, the fact that only register A should have its output enabled. So register A needs an output enable, which is active low of zero. Registers B and C need to have their outputs disabled. So we're gonna supply a one there. We're not gonna leave any input unconnected. We're gonna make sure that everything has either a zero or a one. Once we enable the output from register A, the contents of register A will be placed onto your data bus. So register A will output its data onto these bus lines, and that data is available along the bus. Next, if we want to have register C receive that data, we have to enable it. So we'll take the input enable for register C, set that low, and make sure that registers A and B will not receive the data. So we're gonna set their input enables high. This will allow only register C to accept data from the data bus when the positive transition of the clock signal occurs. So don't forget, we still have the idea of a clock signal here. The clock controls when data transfers. And once everything has been enabled to be transferred, it actually takes a physical clock signal for that data to enter register C. Here's one more question. We're going to assume that the registers shown below initially have a value where register A has 1011, register B has 1000, and register C has 0111. The signals below are applied to the register inputs. So here are the signals being applied. Determine the contents of each register at time 1, time 2, time 3, and time 4. So we're going to do this with a little table. Here's the initial value of each register, and we're gonna go one step at a time to figure out what happens at each time point. So right here, we can see that register B 
has enabled its output. Register C has enabled its input. So when this clock transition occurs, the output of B will be transferred into register C. So register B, its output transfers in to C. At time two, we can go forward and see that register C had its output enabled, but no one received that output because no one had an input enabled. So we have no change at time two. We can see that at time three, there were no registers that had their outputs enabled, no registers that had their inputs enabled, therefore nothing changed at time three. Lastly, we can see at time four that register A had its output enabled, while registers B and C had their inputs enabled. That means the contents of register A are now stored in B and C after this clock pulse. So after time four, all three registers have the same value. This is how we would look at a, a diagram and see as the input enables and output enables change, how that affects what's stored in each register. Remember that in order for output to be stored, an output has to be enabled, an input has to be enabled, and a clock pulse has to occur. Those three things have to occur for the data to physically transfer from run, one register to the next using the bus. Next, we're going to have the same scenario, but determine what would happen if input enable A were low when the third clock pulse occurred. So right here at this third pulse, what would happen if input enable A was low? and everything else was the same. Well, the input enable here would allow register A to receive data, but there are no registers that are outputting data at this point in time. None of the output enables are low at T3. Therefore, input enable, letting the register A have, it, have its input enabled does nothing because it has no data to receive. There's no data on the bus. So if there's no data on the bus, that means that all the register outputs are in their high Z mode and register A would be loaded with unpredictable data. We might call that garbage or system noise. So we do wanna ensure when we're looking at how a data bus operates that you're not enabling an input without also enabling an output. And that is the end of this lecture.